A while back on this show, I had John Bacon on the show, an Anglican priest who found the truth in Catholicism and followed that where it led him, eventually uh, leaving his occasion, leaving his, his ministry, and becoming Catholic, along with his wife and their family. Well, this week on the show, I have John's wife, Lauren Bacon, to unpack kind of her side of the story. And I love stories like these these two perspectives because there's so much value in the other person in that conversation. How is Lauren processing these things alongside her husband? How is she wrestling with these things? And, and what kind of insights does, does she have to bring on the, this situation? Well, as it turns out, a ton. This is an amazing, miraculous story of the conversion of an Anglican priest leaving his vocation, leaving his ministry, and his wife discerning at the same time the beauty and truth of the Catholic Church. And above all else, I think a power couple for Christ, really following where Christ was leading them, seeking that truth just with a hunger and a thirst for that, and landing eventually in the Catholic Church. It's a phenomenal story. I think you'll love it. Please watch. Please leave a thumbs up. All those kind of things you do. Interact. Share this video with friends who you think might be uh, might value this, might learn from this, because there's a lot in here to take away. Please watch and enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, hey, thanks for watching. Please subscribe to this channel, uh, like this video, share it with some friends, leave some comments, all the kind of fun things you do on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast, thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe and follow the show where you find it and leave a rating or review if you can on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, because that helps to push the podcast out to new people and grow the listening base for this show and, and stories like this one. Uh, I am joined this week by Laura. Lauren Bacon. She is an unexpected Catholic convert. She is the wife of John Bacon, a former guest on this show and a former Anglican priest. Uh, she's a faith story lover, mom of four boys, and one more on the way. Congratulations, us too. She's a self-taught water and hand lettering artist uh, with Lauren Bacon illustration. I'll put those links in the show notes because there's some awesome work that you've going on there, Lauren. Uh, thank you for being here. Welcome to the show <laughs> and hello. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, Keith. More to getting sidetracked. Uh, that's awesome. Um, awesome illustration stuff, though. I love the work you do on Instagram. I follow you and uh, and love it. So I'll put links to that in the show notes before I, I forget to to share that. Uh, I was telling you before I, I hit the button to record the show, Lauren, that I, I love these kinds of stories. And this isn't the first time I've had people on the show kind of like this. We had your husband, uh, John, on the show Back in episode 167, I think, back uh, Jan uh, July or June 2022. I'll put, I'll put links to that in the show notes, too, so people can hear that part of the story as well. You're coming on to tell your half of that kind of same story. Uh, we had a while back uh, my friend Kenny Burchard and his wife Mary Jo on the show doing a very similar thing. Kenny was a charismatic pastor. His wife, uh, he told his story. His wife came and told her story. So those episodes are always super popular because people are always dying to hear the other side of the, of the story, not to diminish your own, your own faith journey, which I'm sure is interesting, but it's always cool to hear. Okay. So your husband was an Anglican priest, which is wild, who becomes Catholic and, and everyone's kind of going, okay, but what was his wife thinking <laughs> through all this? Like what was going on? Like, that's a pretty crazy arrangement. You know, you, 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 you meet and marry somebody who's, who's dedicated to the, the priesthood and has this goal and this vision. I'm sure that shapes your, your family outlook and your, your, your thoughts on marriage and, and how you expect your life to go. And then suddenly this happens to you guys and it's, it's entirely different, different <laughs> direction. So I am thrilled to, to, hear you unpack your story. Uh, it's going to be an awesome one. And uh, I'll just get out of the way and and you can start for as far back as you, you want to begin and we'll dig in where it makes sense to dig in. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm dying to hear this. So I'm going to be quiet and let you, you take it away, Lauren. And, and thank you for, for being here to tell it. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to tell our story. Um, I think I'm going to have to start probably in college and and start back when I met John, if that's okay with you. <laughs> I feel like it's going to make the most sense that way. So you're a convert. You understand this roller coaster that is coming <laughs> into the church. And I think John and I, before we even met each other, kind of had this attitude of, Lord, send me. You know, I want to say yes. You you had a guest recently, um, and I think yes, Catholic yeah. was the was the title of what he does. And 
And it's amazing to me because I think as Protestants, we started out after baptism as little kids at about six years old. And there's this super gift of the Holy Spirit and and just this need to say, okay, Lord, like whatever you want me to do. So I remember as a little kid having this passion for faith and telling friends. And and I had friends later that would say, Lauren, do you remember when you shared your faith with me when you were a kid and, and would say that that impacted them? <laughs> so I think John was the same way. So we both um, went to Washita Baptist University for college. And I was so excited because they had a missions program and um, I ended up in education and John was in the missions program too, but we didn't know each other at all. And my sophomore year, I committed to a semester in Africa um, with the International Mission Board, which is a Baptist missions agency. And my best friend and I went and lived in this little hut um, in Niger for about five months. And they gave us a GPS system and they were like, hey, we need you to go find new villages and um, use this recording system to share the gospel with them. (laughs) So in my crazy, naive college girl way, I was like, okay, Lord, like, yes, you know, um, (laughs) And then I came back from that experience looking for other people to connect with that had that kind of depth um, because it, you know, it changes you when you have to say yes to crazy things. So before I went on that trip, I was prayer walking with a friend at Washita. And I remember seeing this guy on a bench with a light yellow polo shirt on and these khaki shorts and he had his Bible and he was praying. And I remember stopping and saying, thank you, Lord, that there's a guy that loves you (laughs) in the middle of this prayer walk. And Sarah and I kept going. And for some reason, that moment just stayed in my head. And then when I got back from Africa, um, I signed up to be a prayer leader for this, for the campus. Um, And we had to have, we had this dance it was a Sadie Hawkins and I was so scared of guys. I did not want to talk to guys. I did not want to have to ask a guy to this dance. Um, but we had to be there. And my friends were like, you need to figure out somebody to ask because you're going to be so bored if you're there with the rest of us and you haven't done it. It's like, okay. So John and I had interacted before and he had been to Peru for a 10 week summer mission trip. And I thought, you know, he would be somebody that I could talk with, you know, it would be easy to talk. Maybe I'll ask him. So we, it was called Barn Bash, um, this dance. And we went and afterwards we climbed some hay bales and sat on them and talked about the gospel and missions. And I was like, dang, this guy's going to be a good friend. I'm so glad that this worked out. He goes back to his dorm and tells his guy friends, I found the girl that I'm going to marry. And <laughs> I had no idea that, you know, that that was his thought process. But um, the reason we connected was because we love the Lord and because we wanted to to say yes and do missions. Um, and we started dating a little bit afterwards and we were taking this history of Christianity class and. Um, And our professor, Dr. Carter, did such a wonderful job of walking us through the history of Christianity that I really think that that was like the oops foundation at the Baptist University for our conversion. Um, I actually talked with a friend this week that said the same thing from our university. There are tons of Anglicans that this Baptist University turns out. There are several Catholics that the the university has recently turned out because the history of Christianity and the um, all of the professors in the Christian studies department are really amazing. <laughs> um, I'm afraid if we go back and tell them, hey, you're turning out so many, <laughs> you know, Anglicans and Catholics that they might be tempted to change. But um it was really special because we had a foundation laid for us that um I guess the Lord had planned and we never could have really asked for. Um, And then after that, we got married and we ended up at Beeson Divinity School, which John talked about as an interdenominational school and becoming Anglican at that point. And our our yes, Lord, at that point was becoming Anglican. Um, And it was tricky. It was really tricky. I don't know what your wife says about... um, your conversion story or this other (laughs) wife says, but that was a period of time that um, 
I think the Lord was gracious in letting us have a tricky time socially, emotionally, and with family coming into the Anglican church because it was a less bumpy ride into the Catholic church. Um, so we got to do like the hard part early, I think. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm thankful for Beeson because we had so many other friends that came from different denominations and ended up becoming Anglican at Beeson with us. And Anglicanism was this beautiful stepping stone um, into the life of the church and the sacraments um, and really opened my eyes to the beauty of the liturgy um, and the beauty of being able to receive Holy Communion and Eucharist every week. That was just such a healing thing for me to be able to confess sins. And, and it was just, um, as a group in the Anglican world. And, um, so, but, but being able to really have this process of where you're realizing the gospel every Sunday in the liturgy, and you're realizing a closeness with Jesus that isn't in the evangelical, you know, Protestant world. I was like, okay, this may not be the emotional hype or whatever of like worship songs or whatever. We had great worship leaders. We love them too. But um, there was a depth that I had never experienced in the Anglican church that I really felt peace with and just a new kind of joy. Um, so I, it was so gracious of God to put us at that seminary um, and to give us the stepping stone that is the beautiful Anglican church um, and all that we learned there. I'm curious what that move was like for you because you guys seem to it's very on fire kind of evangelical Christians. So what was the catalyst towards becoming Anglican for you? What, what did you feel that the, the need the, the need to move down that direction? So I think that first of all, John and I, when we met and married at Washita, a lot of our motivation for for life in general was truth seeking. Yeah. What is truth? Yeah. Um, where can we go to be closer to Jesus? And and how can we do it in such a way that we can bring others with us? And and I think that is like the foundational desire of our of our lives. And I think that um, when we got to Beeson, and I started realizing that there was so much truth and beauty in the sacraments and in the liturgy and the Eucharist. I thought, you know, this might not be as pop culture or as, <laughs> you know, easy to come to church with me. Like you have to actually explain things when you take people into an Anglican or Catholic church. Um, but it was like, there is so much truth in, you know, Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And I thought, okay, when I heard we're getting to partake of Jesus' body and blood often in the sacrament. And, and he so clearly says this, this is my body broken for you. Like I, that's when I started the, the steps towards, oh, this is not a metaphor. He's here. Um, that I really like in the Anglican church is kind of an ambiguous thing. You can be on either side of it. But I started to think I can be closer to Jesus this way. I can receive the Eucharist and, and honestly have an encounter with the Lord and say, I touched him and he's changing me. Um, and at that point, it was funny. So John's first day of Greek, he had this really tough, like professor with a, with a reputation, you know, um, <laughs> and they were going to take this Greek test. And the morning of this Greek test, I had a positive pregnancy test and I was working at Beeson. Um, and I remember sitting down after chapel because I got to go to chapel with John and we made friends. It was so fun. And his friend, our friend Tucker was like, Hey John, how'd you do on that Greek test? And John was like, I was a little distracted. Lauren had a positive pregnancy test this morning. And I was like, oh my gosh, the cat's <laughs> out of the bag. Like all our friends know now first day because John was so excited. But, and he did fine on the Greek test and so did our friends. But I remember John had all these questions about the liturgy and the sacraments. And it was like, okay, 
it's go time. We're going to have a baby. We got to figure out if we're baptizing this baby or not baptizing this baby. And that was the point that I was like, okay, there are all these wonderful things that I'm learning, but this is high stakes. This is really high stakes. Um, because my family, infant baptism is a no, 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 no. Um, there are some intense discussions and consequences for being okay with infant baptism as well as, you know, what they would call believer's baptism. Um, but that was the point that it was like, uh, this is real, (laughs) you know, like my appreciation for the liturgy and my appreciation for the Eucharist. Like this is the point where the rubber meets the road because we're going to have this baby and we got to figure out what to do. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, what came next then? I mean, you guys, Anglicanism as a stepping stone, obviously, because John, we know now was a former Anglican priest, that stepping stone became quite a serious commitment for you guys. So, mm-hmm. so what came next? You're, you're there with a positive pregnancy test. <laughs> all, your, all your friends know, very early days of pregnancy. Yeah. You're, you're, you, you do the research. What do you guys begin to, to kind of land on in terms of... of you know, th- th- there's appreciation that moves, I think, into more of a serious kind of you know, dedication to Anglicanism. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, with our friends that were seeing the same thing, it was so gracious of God to put us in this friend group yeah. where everybody's like, we are drawn to church history and we are drawn to what happens in the movement and the liturgy and, and why we worship this way. But it was funny because Beeson are the... Um, president of the school really appreciated Catholics, but he went to an Anglican church. And so there was no real like place to be able to interact with the Catholic church at all. So I think Anglicanism was as far as we could go. That was the ceiling at that point. And it was funny because I remember saying to John, once we'd become Anglican, because it had been so stressful with family and everything, I was like, this is the ceiling for me, dude. Like, I'm not going to be Orthodox. I'm not going to be Catholic. It's not happening. Like, don't even go there. Don't think about it, you know. Um, But he had this call to pastoral ministry. And we had some really beautiful, um, a really beautiful spiritual director friend named Karen. um, And some great mentors and the people that he worked with. And and they asked questions. And they're like, you know, we think that you are really do have a a call to pastoral ministry. So I remember um, all the questions and interviews to become a deacon and like the psyche vows. And it's like, oh, this is a big thing. (laughs) But it really increased my level of respect for for the Anglican church and now the Catholic church too, because it's like, we're going to be serious about these guys that we let in as priests. We're going to make sure that they're legit and that they're here for the right reasons. And so through the process, it gave me so much confidence, like, okay, these people love the Lord and they love people. And so I think there was this unfolding of comfort that happened as John went through the process. It was like, this is a, this is the place that the Lord meant us to be for now. So it was a, it was a gift to be there. Um, and I think there was healing that happened for both of us um, with our, friend that was a spiritual director and the the priest that were there and it was like okay the lord is doing work here you know you have the the sense of peace that comes in the hard times and there were there are crazy things that happen john told you about the house fire and ezekiel's type 1 diabetes diagnosis um and and other things personally that were happening with me waking up to history you know um so it was like craziness happening all around us, but the Lord was doing this inner work um, that was peaceful and helpful. And I thought, okay, I, I see the Lord in this. And and even though it's crazy as John pursues the priesthood, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and it was turbulent, even you said with your family, like with the, the dynamics of some of these things that you're beginning to embrace, I guess, looking at church history and trying to figure out where these things land coming to conclusions that are at odds with things that you believe for, for all of your life. And you, mm-hmm. you were a serious person. You were a serious Christian. You weren't just kind of taking your faith lightly and had adopted these views kind of willy-nilly. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like you guys were serious with your faith, had believed these things, and were making a really concerted effort, like, like struggling against 
making a, a, a change, but really come to conclusions that were op- opposed to what you believed and then opposed to people around you that still believe those things, right? Like you said, baptism for, for one thing, for example, mm-hmm. you know, a high view of the sacraments, these things, like that's, that's the hard work of, of conversion, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's not easy. Nothing about it is easy. And it's amazing how John would come home with something new that he would find theologically um, as we're growing in this way. And we would chew on it and wrestle with it. And he'd tell me about all these church fathers that he's reading. And so for days, I mean, I really felt like I went to Beeson with him because I worked (laughs) there for a while and before we had Ezekiel. And he would come home and walk me through the process of you know, these church fathers and the church history and like Old Testament, New Testament classes. Like I got everything but the Greek and the Hebrew just because John is a good teacher and would come home and be like, okay, I'm working through this. I need your opinion. So he would teach me, which if you know, John, um, he's passionate and he is really great with logic and, and, and rhetoric really. I mean, boom, 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 boom. So it's like, okay, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah, that that's amazing. You you had that education, that learning along alongside of him. I love that. You know, many of us converts, myself included, do it backwards. Where I do all the work. You know, I I joke that I used to binge YouTube uh, before we had kids. I'd be on YouTube watching RCA videos or Journey Home videos till like three in the morning. And my wife slept upstairs. No idea what I was doing downstairs this, this whole time until I kind of sprung on her. Like, oh, by the way. I'm thinking of becoming Catholic and it was like a lightning bolt. And there's so many stories like that from, from especially men in the family doing all this work on the side and then going, Oh, by the way, I, I'm thinking of like, I think we're too scared to say anything before it's too late. Like I was, you know, cause you're, you, you're in, in, in the, uh, uh, the faith with your, your spouse. Like my wife and I, you know, we, we met in this, in the student church together. We worshiped together. We served together in this church. We, you know, we joined the family church and we had, we had had kids and like we're in this church together. Our, our, our marriage is wrapped around our faith and and vice versa. Right. And to make that, make that shift to, to, to change. Like suddenly if I'm becoming Catholic and my wife is not joining with me immediately, it's like this disconnect that like we've never in our life before had this disconnect. This is so different for us. How do we ever make these, this thing work? It's such a strange thing when your faith is so central. So yeah, for, for you guys, Beautiful example for anyone out there listening of, of how to do it the, the right way for the most part, right? Kind of journeying together because you, you avoid that, you know, and I'm sure for you guys, there was internal discussions and, and disagreements over different things that you're, you're talking about, but you're at least you're journeying together, mm-hmm. right? Not the surprise. Oh, by the way, I think I'm becoming Catholic, honey. Like, right. That's like a bomb. <laughs> yeah, it is. Boom. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. I- if John had done that, I think I would have, you know, dug my grave and <laughs> laid in it. Like I definitely had to have the process with yeah. him of all the, of all the little steps for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, God is gracious in hindsight for, for our marriage, for most of the people that talk to on this show, even us, even those of us who dropped the bomb like that, things do work out in the end. My wife became Catholic a year after me, after some long discussions and, and meeting an awful therapist who would try to talk me out of becoming Catholic and ended up Convincing us both to become it was a great it's a great story because he ended up the 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 for us the time that I knew that she was serious about about this Catholic journey was when she began defending my beliefs to this Anabaptist marriage counselor that we yes. we, we were seeing and I thought I look over and I thought okay she she knows why I'm becoming Catholic I think I think she likes this and, and and believe this too and that was an amazing experience for us as much as we hated paying that guy all that money. Whenever we saw him and just wasn't very helpful, but hey, in the end, thank you. I appreciate that, that experience. My wife and I are on the same her. page now. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I guess it worked. I guess, I guess after all, I guess that, that worked. So for you guys, I guess here you are then on this journey where, where John is looking at pastoral ministry very seriously. You are staring down the, the, the barrel? That's the wrong word. <laughs> the wrong kind of, no. You're sense. looking down the tunnel of, of being a, a, a pastor's wife, Anglican pastor's wife, as part of your identity, uh, you know, in this, in this family. Uh, what begins to, what, what comes next, I guess? Because we know from having John on the show that he's, He's not not an English pastor anymore. So obviously you guys kept asking questions. Where 
your perspective on this, what, what kind of happened next after, after that uh, on this journey? So I really thought my ceiling was Anglicanism. I truly um, was at a place where I think if Jesus had shown up in front of me and said, you're going to be Catholic next without all of the steps, I would have been like, <laughs> no, you know, like that's not my, that's not my normal thing. Um, but I think I was at the place where I was like, okay, I think I've hit my max here. I really think I've hit my max here. Um so the Lord was gracious again and gave us some time as John was um, becoming a church planting priest. So he was ordained at um, St. Peter's in Birmingham. Beautiful time with friends. And after that, there was this um, discernment period where they were like, okay, do you want to just have a church or do you want a church plant? How do you want to do that? And John is a fiery sucker. He's a go-getter. <laughs> he um, he really likes to look at scripture and history and tradition and say, okay, are we doing this well? Are we doing church well? Are we leading people faithfully? Are we teaching faithfully? And so at that point, he was still in seminary, and I really felt like we could dig. Um, so we went looking, and we interviewed for church planting training, essentially, to say, is this something that we fit into? Um, and we met some really awesome people. And there was a super kind priest named John Wallace who was like, I think, I think maybe we want to interview guys, you guys, and, and bring you on board. So we ended up in Florida with them. And we met, um, that was another healing time, I think, that the Lord knew that I needed before we came into the Catholic Church and, and learning time. Um it was a really sweet two years of John being able to preach and learn pastoral care um, from Father John um, and and to take a look at something that we didn't have in seminary. Like you can't learn pastoral care well until you're practicing it with somebody. So praise God, he had somebody sweet, you know, to teach that. Um, but the plan was supposed to be to stay there for two or three years and then church plant in the area. Um, and so John's ordained at this point. Um, we have fundraised an, a ridiculous amount of money to try to be able to live. So I'm like shaking as I'm talking about this time period because it was, it was taxing. Um, John did most of the footwork, but there was a lot of like, Oh, there are a lot of faith involved, you know? So at that point, like our faith muscles are strengthening, yeah. I think, um, which I, I would not have the strength to come into the Catholic church. I think if we hadn't had these people and, and this healing internally, um, from family of origin stuff, you know, all of these steps that it was like, Oh, I get what the Lord was doing now in hindsight. Um, so we had these two years as John was learning how to preach, learning how to do pastoral care. And then um, in 2018, Hurricane Michael came through and we had to run to Birmingham for a month because we didn't have floor, like water that was that was drinkable um, and, and there wasn't electricity for a while. And so we're in Birmingham for this month and we're looking into the face of okay, we're not training as much anymore and we're really church planting. And it gave us some time to look at the plan. And we ended up figuring out the diocese wants us to do one thing. And our home church that we've been at has a different vision. And th these visions are complementary, but they're not, they're not super in sync. And so there are a couple of things like the hurricane came through the area like right next to the area where we were going to church plant and, and, you know, all these little pieces that it was like, okay, is this the thing or is this not the thing, you know? Um, so we know we love the Eucharist. We know we love people. We know that the Lord has called John to be in ministry. And it's so stressful watching my husband go through this time of like, crisis. Do we stay here? Do we go? And there was a church in Missoula, um, in Montana that had invited him to come up several years before that. And I had been like, mm, nope, I can't do the snow. I can't, you know, I see myself as 
depressed and stuck if I have little kids in a snowy place instead of in the South. And I don't want to leave the South is what I told him after seminary. So he had been gracious to me and taking the Florida position instead um, because I needed the sunshine at that point And I was scared. <laughs> um, but as John is having this crisis of, is this the right thing? Is this the right place? Um, after the hurricane, we ended up coming up to Missoula for more church planting training. And I think John talked to you about, he really started to have, a realization that in the Anglican church, the, the places that you can fall theologically are so wide and ambiguous that, that it wasn't helpful for pastoral care. And he was like, you know, some of my priest friends are over here on the theological issue. And some of my priest friends are over here. And when people come to me asking questions, it's really hard for pastoral care to say, well, this is what scripture says, but, you know, or yeah. whatever that was happening there. And so um, I think there was a time when we moved to Montana that was like, is this the thing? You know, is the Anglican church like where you want us to be, Lord? And and is this what we're supposed to do? And so we were supposed to come up to Calus, build a church plant. And we came up with some sweet friends, Robert and Melissa, and had started this church plant. And we were meeting in our home on Sunday evenings and had the sweetest group of um, young professionals and young couples coming in and John's teaching and he is realizing that he is more Catholic than Anglican. And, and in the background, we're having these conversations that he's like, well, I'm reading John Henry Newman and I'm reading, you know, um, who else was he reading at that point? There are several other people. And he came home and he's like, Lauren, I think, I think I might be Catholic. And I was like, <laughs> no, you're not. This church plant is working and we have fundraised and we worked our butts off for like four years. No, you're not becoming Catholic. <laughs> um, but he got invited to this men's group by an Orthodox priest friend that was also thinking of converting who had a successful church plant here in the Valley. Um, and then we had some friends from our Missoula church plant that lived in Polson that had received a copy of Rome Sweet Home at the same time. And so the Lord, it's like he strategically <laughs> places you with these people um, that are on the same journey. And so we had these Orthodox friends and these Anglican friends that were also the Lord was starting to help them in their journey towards the Catholic church. And, um, John started going to these meetings and there were several guys that were like, so the Anglican church believes this. What do you believe, John? And he would give these Catholic answers and they were like, John, like, that's what the catechism says, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, yes, this is in scripture here and this is in the catechism here. So why aren't you Catholic? And he um, went to these meetings for about a month and I was loving the church planting thing, feeling like it was going great in the Anglican world. And he comes home and he's like, honey, I think I'm Catholic. Like, th like it's more sure now. And I start hearing him talk about being Catholic in every, every area of life. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can't handle this. <laughs> like we were basically, there was disowning going on for becoming Anglican in my family. Um, and it was painful. And, and there were people for years um, that didn't talk to us. And um, I thought, you're going to throw away your career and, and you're going to throw away all of this support that we've had for church planting for four years. And you're just going to toss it to go to a church that I really still have some big issues with like Marian, Marian theology and like, and, and Pope and abuse in the church and all these really big stumbling blocks that I was like, I don't think I can do that um, for our kids, for myself. And John was like, okay, but I need you to take an honest look at, what I'm seeing here. And I was so mad, Keith. I was so mad. <laughs> it was like, 
uh, we have blood, sweat, and tears have gone into this Anglican church planting thing. And you want me to do what? Um, so he got me a copy of Rome Sweet Home. And we have this, we had this gym and he knew I needed a break as a mom. So he's like, look, I'll give you a day to do your mom things. Go sit in the hot tub, um, go read Rome Sweet Home, go work out, whatever you want to do. I'll take the kids. There, there are four children at this point and he's offering me a day of rest. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, I will go read Rome Sweet Home in the hot tub. So I took it. And I remember four chapters in, I realized that Kimberly resisted for years and it caused strife for her and Scott. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, trust me, trust me, trust <laughs> me, like have faith here. Um, I've been working your faith muscle for years. It's time to use it. And, and I felt like I was dying for a little bit. Because it was like, we have all these donors that aren't going to get it. And we have all these friends. And, you know, the list that that I was coming up with in my head was not pretty. Um, but I feel like when the Lord asks you to do something and he does it so clearly, it's like, okay, I can fight for years. And I can be, you know, Kimberly Hahn came around, praise the Lord. And their marriage has been so <laughs> fruitful and their ministry has been so fruitful. But I wish I could tell her thank you. And I wish I could tell Scott thank you. Um, because it's like, I felt like the Lord was whispering to my heart, don't cause the strife. Don't cause the grief. Just trust. And so after that day, I was like, okay, I'm going to take an honest look at this. And I'm going to take an honest look at my hard questions. Um, and one by one, the Lord helped all of the stumbling blocks to fall. And, and he, um, it, it's such a sweet thing. And I feel like it's going to be a sweet thing to be able to tell our kids and grandkids. These are the ways that the Lord showed me that he was in this in really, really concrete ways. Um, so at that point I felt like I was stepping off a cliff <laughs> again, <laughs> you know, um, saying yes to ministry and having a husband who's a pastor and not making a ton of money and knowing that, you know, it's like, okay, poor for life, check, you know, like all these ministry check marks that you get because you're a teacher and have done ministry. It's like, um, okay, we feel like, you know, cliff dive, here we go again. Um, but, but in that time, because of the people that the Lord had put us with, um, I was like, I see his movement here. I see that he's working in, um, the Edwards family, our friends that were wanting to be Anglican, like they were church planting too. Um, they received that copy of Rome Sweet Home at the same time. And she was like, I'll read it with you, Lauren. We'll talk about it. And her kids read it and they read it and they converted at the same point we did. And then um, these, this Orthodox priest friend had been coming over and answering questions. And one day I was like, you know, I really have these hangups. And he looked at me before he walked out and he was like, trust your husband. You need to trust your husband. I was like, <sighs> so, you know, you have these days where it's like, okay, I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust. And then other days where it's like, Oh, this is so hard, <laughs> you know? Um, but I remember when John talked to our bishop in the Anglican world and was like, I believe that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. I believe that Jesus says, this is my body broken for you and means it. Um, and he was like, okay, you're Catholic. So you can't be an Anglican church planter anymore. And it was like, okay, we're not going to have an income this summer at all. Um, and we had had this sweet couple over and he handed me a copy of the surrender novena at a beautiful time. And so I remember those nine days, um, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Um, just this piece. Um, even though we knew that we weren't going to have an income for the summer and within that month, um, the Lord provided what we needed for the summer, not through church planting, not through John's job, through his people. Um, and, and we didn't even know all these people, <laughs> you know, John went hiking, um, 
with a group of guys one weekend and they heard his story about converting and they sent him home with cash and we're like, <laughs> we know that your family needs this. Take it and be blessed. I don't know what this guy's name is still. Uh -huh. um, and then we had our priest over, Father Rod, um, one night for dinner. And I was like, I need to talk to you about some of my hangups. Um, confession was a hangup for me in the beginning because I was like, okay, I thought, you know, you confess to Jesus, whatever, you know. But then, so he's sitting at our table and I'm like, so what would you do in this situation with our kids around for confession? And he um, answered so graciously. He was like, I would ask that person questions about their situation first and not like jump to a conclusion essentially. And like just answered my hangups in such a in such a, a gracious manner. And at the end of the night, I was like, okay, Father Rod, um, this is scary financially, and we don't know what John's going to do for a job. And he was like, well, you need to ask St. Joseph for prayer and, and Mother Teresa to pray for you. And I was like, oh, that's another hang up. You know, these, <laughs> these, this asking saints for intercession is not something that I'm comfortable with, and I haven't practiced it yet. Um, but he had this long list of people that he said, you should get them to pray for you. And so, um, this is in 2020 and I think, I think we had about $5,000 of debt that I was stressing over, um, because of John not having an income. Well, we didn't have an income at that point. Um, and so I remember going to brush my teeth and I was brushing my hair in the bathroom downstairs and I was like, okay. St. Joseph, if you're with Jesus and you can hear me and you care, will you, will you ask the Lord to provide for us and, and to, and to help here? And I left it at that. I didn't tell anybody, um, that, it, that I had taken the risk. Um, and the next day I got a call from our girl who had been doing our church planting finances and who was wrapping everything up for us as we were leaving. And she was like, Hey, uh, there's a donor that gave five grand at the end of December. Do you, do you want me to, to put it on this, this, I think it was our last check. Do you want me to put it on this last check? And I just like, you know, it was one of the last ones. Um, wow. and I just, I thought I was going to lose my teeth, you know, it was like, okay, there's something to be said for taking the risk to have to ask saints to pray for us. Um, so I started digging into Hebrews and like the veil being thin and, and the cloud of witnesses cheering us on. And I was like, okay, I think there's something to this. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And I love those actual, right. Working those things out like that in, in real time. I think it's a, is amazing. Right. I have, I have stories like that too, working those things out and going, well, I'll, I'll try this and, and gosh, the saints don't disappoint. Yeah. Many times, right? Especially if you're seeking like that, right? Just, I mean, I think the same thing for me applies to something like adoration. Like, if you are questioning whether the, whether Christ is present in the Eucharist, well, go check it out, right? And and, and Christ will meet you <laughs> in those places if you're curious, right? If you're curious about how the saints work, if they can really pray for us and hear us and their prayers are effective, well, tr try it out, right? And they often meet us like that in those places, right? I can remember for me one of the goofiest times on my conversion journey. I was questioning whether this thing with the saints was real. And I remember I heard that Pope Francis always prayed to uh, St. Therese of Lisieux and asked to, for him to, her to send him a flower to let, to let him know that she's praying for him. And I thought, it sounded kind of corny to me as an evangelical. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll try this and see what, see what happens. And so I said this prayer. I said, you know, St. Saint, Saint Therese of Lisieux, pray for me. Uh, and, and send me a flower to let me know that, that, you've, that you've prayed for me. And sure enough, I'm at the gym and I'm on the treadmill and the, the wall of, of, of TV is showing the, the news, you know, whatever, 24-hour news network, this picture of this missing person, this older lady, just flashes on the screen, huge picture. She's wearing a giant hat with a huge flower on it like unmistakable this giant flower like huge almost comical like it was like a ridiculous hat to wear for a missing person's picture and there it is and i thought okay well 
there's my flower. <laughs> like there's, there's my sign. She was found later on. I looked it up and she was found safe. This older lady who wandered from her house. Thank you. know, thanks be to God. But what, a you know, these kind of things that you, you question on the journey, I feel like when we try those things out, the, the results are, are, are pretty immediate. Sometimes yeah. kind of comical in my yeah. case, I mean, miraculous in yours. Like the, you know, the money that you were owing is, is mysteriously here kind of the next day that's amazing yeah. right it is it is and i think there's so much i don't know i i think you were pentecostal right before you guys converted um it's sweet because it's like the holy spirit gives us courage yeah. in the moment so there's there there might be fear about trying the new things and and he really does step in in the gap and and fill those spaces when we need it um it's exciting too like it takes courage to try but but it's so exciting and it's so faith-giving and it almost makes you want to do the next thing all the time okay lord what's the next thing so what was for you guys the next thing then so john realizes he can't be anglican priest anymore he's kind of resigning your finances are are out do, do you just you take the leap is that the next step to say okay we're we're committing to this. Yeah. When our Anglican bishop was like, okay, if you believe that the Eucharist is Jesus' body and blood, <laughs> like he says it is, um, then you're out. <laughs> and we were like, I mean, and he said it a little bit more graciously than that, but he's like, <laughs> enjoy your journey in the Catholic church was, was essentially wow. where he put wow. us. And that was our, that was our blessing to go. And he did, he, he did give us a blessing to go. And it was like, okay, <sighs> that part of the journey is done. This part of the journey is, is beginning. Um, and at that point, we were like, all right, Lord, um, you provided for this month. Like, do you want us to stay here? What do you want us to do? So super kind friend, Giorgio, the one that picked at John on men's night stuff that really, really picked at him <laughs> and like pushed him over the edge. Um, I think he felt a little bit responsible for our family coming to the church at that point. Um, so he was leaving and he was like, hey, the church needs a DRE um, and a teacher like I think John's a great fit for the job. So he did some really sweet work before he left um, and and helped get the interviews for John to be able to work at St. Matthew's. And I just felt like that was confirmation from the Lord that there was a place right here with the people that we loved already. Um, and he was saying, I'm providing for you in this way, in this step in the journey. And um, it was beautiful. I started RCIA and... I have this weird thing about me. I absolutely love internationals. I love international people. And Kalispell is filled with internationals. And so we have this friend um, who is a dear friend, like an uncle to our kids now. Um, but he's in RCIA with me. His name is Almaz. And um, when Lacey and I were in Africa, it was with Muslim people. And I got to sit next to a Muslim friend that was converting to the Catholic Church while I was in RCIA. Uh -huh. And... And really going through this journey of learning the language and like figuring out the states, but also really serious about figuring out his faith and little, little things like that was like, the Lord is doing a work here. Um, so we began to have this community as we're coming into the church and the sponsors that we have are from Birmingham, Alabama. And, you know, we have this really sweet <laughs> ladies group that we've started to tell faith stories because there are so many converts in our area. And so I felt like the Lord just gifted us with close people before um, our confirmation Easter 2021. And it was like, okay, these are people who are faithful to the Lord and who are really asking him to lead them. And so it felt like we were in this space where all these people were serious about their faith and the Lord was giving John ministry and the Lord was giving me friends and ministry at the same time. And it was like, okay, this has been hard. This has been really hard. And, and the Lord, um, taught me some humility in my stubbornness, I think, um, and in having to really take a hard look at all of the common misconceptions about the Catholic Church that I had learned growing up and and having to tackle those head on one by one. Um, and, and I still, I have friends that are like, we just don't see that in scripture. And I'm like, oh, it, it makes me so sad because it's like, okay, there, um, 
there has been a, a lack of good teaching, you know, for a time in the Catholic church. And I feel like there's this, there's this passion from John and, and for me too, really, to be able to say, okay, let's take a look at the gifts of history and tradition that the Lord has given us. And let's take a look at the gift of scripture and let's take a look at how those go together and, and how the Lord uses those. And so, um, it almost feels like a challenge to me, which sorry, friends, I love you guys, the ones that are at that point, but I'm like, I want to tell the world, like, there's this beautiful gift that the Lord has given us in the church. And, and it is, it is biblical. Um, and so I feel like I didn't, I didn't think it was either before, before we made the journey home to the Catholic church. And now it's like, okay, I'm, you know, there's still things that I'm having to learn. And there's still like, how do we answer this common misconception or this difficulty? Like the Catholic church is not perfect. You know, no Protestant church is perfect. Um, no Orthodox church is perfect, you know, um, cause we're made up of people. But I think I realized at this point, like, um, when, when Jesus said on this rock, um, I'm going to build my church through Peter, like he meant for it to stand and he meant for it to be here for until he returns. And so there's so much peace in knowing, oh, this thing that Jesus started is still here. And and we get to introduce our kids to this beautiful thing that's been around for so long that, that the Lord meant to give, give as a gift, you know, to, to Christians. Um, so I think I think as we were joining the church, it, it felt like there was so much sweet community that like the hard stuff kind of falls to the side. Um, you know, and, and I think now that we've been in the church for a while, it's like, Oh, now I see the broken spaces more, you know, there's, you take a deep breath and you say, um, Lord, what do you want to do with this? You know, and, and, and how do I dive deep? But, um, the coming in part, I think, he just surrounded with with kind gifts for us yeah i think that's amazing and i think it's interesting as you tell that because it really the hard it sounded like the hard part was becoming anglican that was really the hardest like that was the biggest leap right it seems like almost a natural progression from there to kind of keep going a bit further and and and, and become catholic right that was almost less of a paradigm shift than becoming Anglican to begin with, right? But at both at both stages, you guys are surrounded by friends and people that are on that journey with you and mm -hmm. and and walking with you. I think that's a really awesome, I mean, miracle, I think, to have because not everyone has that experience. A lot of people have experience of kind of doing it by themselves or with their spouse and kind of in, in isolation. But to have those those friends and, and see those those people who are who are asking and answering those same questions and then also see serious Catholics who are who are bringing you along, right? Who can, who can answer questions that you have and can mm -hmm. interact like that. That's such a, sometimes it's a rare thing, right? To encounter those. And I think, and I love your idea of this, this mission of, of the, the, this challenge accepted, right? To really show this vibrant Catholic faith and why we love it so much. Because that's sometimes hard to find for somebody who's looking at the Catholic church from, from the outside, right? I know for mm -hmm. me as an evangelical, like the Catholics that, that we knew were these ex-Catholics. They were in our evangelical church that would talk about how I used to be Catholic. I didn't know, you know, mm -hmm. it was all just ritual and, and rites and like, and, and, and kneeling and standing and, and repeated prayers. And now I have a relationship with Jesus and I know him really well. And, and that's why I'm evangelical now. I'm not, I'm not Catholic anymore, right? There was always that, that contrast. Mm -hmm. And then, so then for us, we kind of heaped up these misconceptions about the Catholic church based on some of those kind of interactions yeah. and things you would hear from the pulpit in the Protestant world, how they would see Catholics doing all these things and not understand them. But you know, like you say, it's the interactions with, with good Catholics who know their faith, it's, you realize the misconceptions you have. So it's often, it, right, it, it's not, it's, it's for me often not these deep theological things that we disagreed about. It was things I didn't understand that Catholics believed. And when I understood that, you're like, oh, okay, well that, yeah, that makes sense actually. I, I get, I get that, that that now, right? Not that we disagreed on something, but I thought they believed it differently than I than I did. Right? I thought we disagreed. Actually, we we don't. And how they believe it, it's actually a bit more beautiful than how how I had this thing figured out, right? Yes, there's so much humility that comes from ah, from yeah. learning because it's like, oh, my brain was so small, you know. 
Um, and it's worth it's worth when you have a question saying, where does that come from? Yeah. You know, and why? And 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 having curiosity um goes a long way. It's a blessing. Cause there are riches in the in the church that uh I would have been grieved when I got to heaven if that treasure chest had been left closed. You yeah. know, oh. I feel like there are these treasure chests that that with my kids, my kids are learning about the lives of the saints and they're learning that they have extra people to pray for them, you know, that we never would have known about in the Protestant world. And I, I was almost kind of mad for a minute. Like <laughs> w- these things were hiding and they weren't telling them about us. Like this is such a huge blessing. Yeah. I think that's amazing. And the, the saints for me is a huge thing because, you know, as, as a, a Protestant Christian, we, you know, you're always told, okay, be like Jesus. Like you, you want to, you know, that's an example for you to to emulate, to live your life like that. And we had the, the apostles and we occasionally had different biographies of different people. You know, we'd, we'd bond off for maybe the, these different Christians throughout the, the ages who live kind of holy lives, but they're very few and far between, mm-hmm. right? And so mm-hmm. for me, discovering the saints, you go, okay, well, <laughs> Wow, first of all. And then, okay, so here's how I can actually tangibly live like Jesus in all these different contexts, right? Yes. Versus just reading the Gospels and going, okay, here's how Jesus acted in this situation. I get trying to, I get trying to apply that to my life now some way, even though I'm not, you know, a, a carpenter, I'm not preaching in a temple, or there, there aren't Pharisees all around me. How can I apply this? We're, we're given in the stories of the saints actual tangible ways to, to live out that, that mission, like like Christ, that the church says, yeah, here's a holy thing you can emulate to be more like more like Jesus. Like discovering that, like you say, is like a treasure chest unopened. You go, oh my gosh, like <laughs> no one no one told me this. This is this is so unfair. It is, right? and it was, and now it's like I want to tell everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's amazing. Let's talk a bit uh, in the last little bit here about maybe r- r- raising kids, and you know, and because. That again, this show tries to, I try to deal with this because for me, it's a very tangible thing for my wife and I. We, mm-hmm. you know, we were, we became Catholic or she became Catholic um, a year after me, but the same year our son was baptized. So like they're the same age of Catholic, my wife and, and our <laughs> and our newborn son, right? And we very much, you know, raised our kids as we ourselves were growing in the faith. And so mm-hmm. it's an interesting place to be. And so many listeners to this show and emails that I get are people asking those questions, like how... I'm scared of becoming Catholic because I don't know how we'll ever raise our kids this way, right? The the parishes that I see have nothing going on for kids. There's no young mm-hmm. families. There's no, where's the Sunday school? Like, where's the, where's the VBS? Where are these things we used to plug our kids into, right? It, it's a scary shift to make. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, thoughts, advice, like how did you guys begin to make that, make that shift to, to, to raise your kids in a faith that you were kind of unpacking as you went? I think that is part of the beauty of it too. There's a, there's a learning that we get to do together. Yeah. (laughs) And I would say our oldest son is eight years old and is passionate about the Lord and is kind of stubborn like John. Um, He's a little (laughs) bit hard headed. (laughs) Um, He teaches me things as he learns. And so there is a mutual learning that's going on. And, and I, I think that there's a mutual excitement as well. Um, because as he comes back from his classes and as he reads, um, new books, it's, it's so interesting because he will have passion and excitement about something and get to share it. And I honestly get to engage in a way that's exciting back and forth because it's like, he is, excited about the Lord and excited about learning how to be close to the Lord. And we get to, we get to do this thing together. So I think it's almost a blessing to be walking through it together because it's like an adventure and a discovery trip as we go. And I think really leaning into the gifts that God has given John as a dad and me as a mom, um, I think as you, as a family, identify the gifts that you have, leaning into those things is priceless. Um, and there, it, it, it's tricky. I'm sure it's tricky um, for for people that are, you know, haven't been educated in Old Testament, New Testament, all these things to be like, where do we start? Um, 
but but with prayer, um, John has found this word on fire liturgy of the hours, and it is so simple to follow for prayer. Um, there's morning, midday, and evening, um, and night prayer, and it is simple enough for my six or eight year old to read and to get through, and it helps them memorize scripture. They're they're interacting with the Psalms, they're interacting with um, different gospel passages. And so I feel like just the word on fire liturgy of the hours checks so many boxes yeah. with introducing kids to faith because it's like, okay, how do we learn scripture? How do we learn prayer? Um, how do we foster this growth as a family? And I would say it's seven bucks a month. Um, and it's so worth it because it's like uh, teaching me as we go and teaching them I remember, quick story before we wrap up, there was a day that had been extra hard with the kids. We homeschool. Um, we have a pretty small house. There are four boys. And we live in a really cold place. So by the end of the day, sometimes I'm ready to run away. Um, <laughs> but John, <laughs> John does evening prayer with them every night. And this is one of the nights that he was teaching RCIA and men's group. So he wasn't there. So... I'm like taking a deep breath. Okay, it's time to check my attitude and pray with the kids before bed, you know? Um, and I remember opening to that night in this liturgy of the hours. And one of the things that was repeated that night um, was, Lord, your love for us is constant and and you don't grow weary in your love for us, I think was the exact <laughs> phrase. You don't grow weary in your love for us. And it was like, oh, this sweet reminder um, as a parent that the Lord brings refreshment. And also it was like, oh, Lord, my heart needed this tonight, you know, for, for being able to do tonight and tomorrow with my kids. Um, but also I think it was a breath of fresh air for the kiddos too. And we get to share moments like that. Um, I think when we do simple, obedient things like praying together. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you wish for your kids at, at the core, right? To love scripture, to love God, to love prayer. Mm -hmm. And that's so beautiful. I mean, that that that's amazing. That makes me want to become Catholic if I wasn't already. Yay! <laughs> Stories like that, right? I think that's amazing because, again, I, I love your guys' story because it's really like you guys— uh, both of you, your passion for, for the Lord, your passion for following Christ where he leads is evident in your stories, right? It's just really, it's, I'm sure there's, there's, and you've mentioned there's times of trial and, and strife and difficulty, and surely there, those things come and go. And I'm sure there are more ahead for all of us following, following the Lord. But you guys, you, you just push forward. I think your unstoppable drive to follow Christ where he leads you is this trajectory like, shoom, and, and, that's amazing. I mean, it's not a small thing to give up your 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 vocation as as an Anglican priest and your income to to become Catholic. That's that's a pretty big deal, right? And so they think you know, your story is so encouraging for those who are who are thinking of that becoming Catholic, you know, in general. But gosh, I I have a prayer list of of names of people that I know are out there who are really who are in a, a, a pastoring role. Mm -hmm. who are on the fence going, how can I ever give this up? How can I take this next step? And so mm -hmm. I, I appreciate your, you know, your story, your perspective, especially too, right? For those, those, those guys' wives, <laughs> right? Yeah. To, hear, to, to hear how, you know, the, the victory on the other side, that mm -hmm. there is a, a, a path forward and that, that, that God is faithful in, in stories like this. I mean, it's amazing how, you, how your story has turned out so far. I think that's, that, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll cry <laughs> thinking about it. Um, take the leap, guys. God's faithful. And 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 your faith will be strengthened if you're on the fence. <laughs> that, that's that's awesome. Well, I don't know if you have any, I don't know, that's a good closing thought, but any any closing thoughts that you want to share that we didn't get to that you think is something important that, that you didn't get to mention yet? So I think, um, as I was thinking about tonight, uh, the driving factor in our faith story has been, what is truth? And yeah, Lord, yeah. Lord, what do you want us to do? And so if you're on the fence or if you're praying um, and wondering, life's meant to be lived. And and not, if we're scared and we sit in a corner um, 
and don't take steps and don't take leaps. We're not going to be able to see God's faithfulness. But when you say yes to the things that he whispers, follow me in, it's like, I don't know, there's no greater gift. Our our professors at Washita, um, the Baptist University we went to when we were studying for ministry, were like, you guys will probably never have money, but you will have rich friendships and you will have stories of the Lord's provision that make life worth living (laughs) and praise God for those sweet professors because it's true. Um, and, and God is faithful. So when he whispers, I need you to do this. Yes. Is the best answer. (laughs) That's awesome. I love that. Amen. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Uh, Lauren, you don't have a, a series of books or a series of YouTube talks or like uh, an, an online course to share, but is there a place you want to point people towards to follow things that you do or resources you want to recommend or things you want to point people towards? What do you, what, what do you want to tell people who are, who want to know more? Yeah. Um, if you guys have questions about Catholic faith or you're on the fence, Scott Hahn's Signs of Life was super helpful for me in the first year or so um, because it reads like a almost like a textbook for lay people, you can go like, okay, I've got questions about um, confession. And you can go look at all of the biblical resources. I think um, the, it's biblical roots is um, Catholicism and it's biblical roots. Um, So Scott Hahn in these passages is like, okay, this is why we do confession. And he, he takes you to scripture and lets you know, and it's in bite size amounts. And it really helped my heart the first year coming into the church. Cause it's like, okay, I've got a question about this. I can open signs of life and, and see scripture with church history and tradition together. So I think that's the book. Um, as a simpler mind than my husband <laughs> that I would recommend for people if um, if you're a wife on the fence and have and have trouble or John and I actually had a couple visit us um, after his interview with you Keith um, they flew across the country and we're like we just want to talk with the uh, like a couple that's done this and we sat down and had dinner with them in Kalispell um, and they told us about their story and where they were in their journey. And it was such a joyful process and we've still been talking and we've given them books and resources. Um, so happy to answer questions, um, over email. If you have them, Lauren at Lauren bacon illustration.com, or if you need a theological, um, discussion, John's email, we can put somewhere, um, because we love the questions. And also, um, my friends introduced me to Jen Fulweiler, who was actually an atheist um, before she converted. And her book, um, that's a memoir about coming into the church. Um, oh, gosh, I wish I could remember the name. It's about happiness. Yeah, yeah. I can put it in the show notes. so We can find it. Okay. Um, her, her memoir is beautiful. We've got a couple friends um, locally that were atheists and came into the church. And so her story... Is, has been a special one to me as well. <laughs> that's awesome. Something other than God, maybe is it that the yeah, one? Good yeah, good job. <laughs> I, I love that one. Yeah, yes. That's, that's fantastic. Me too. Love that book. And did you say, are you offering your house for people to come visit you? Is that, <laughs> is that, I, I kind of caught that in the middle there. Maybe right. just fly over and see you guys and, and have a chat. That's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. When we were church planting, we had people in the house all the time. And so hospitality kind of came to a screeching halt for a little bit as we came into the church. So um, we will meet you at a restaurant locally if you come to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> I may I'm, I may come just for a break if you guys yes. want. Yes. <laughs> do it. Do it. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Lauren, this has been really fun. Uh, I appreciate connecting with you and hearing your story and, and telling your story here. Uh, you guys are awesome. An awesome power couple for Christ. And I can't wait to see what happens next in in your journey because it's it's awesome so thanks for being here god bless the work you guys are doing for the church and uh and thanks it's been awesome yeah thanks keith it was so fun